Hi. So Dario from Milano. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> okay, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to have everyone here. And uh, we start back the first mini course of this year. It's, uh, we were commenting before that has been going on since three years. So it's, um, it's nice because every, every mini course is a different crowd. And uh, we can afford to have very good speakers sharing their passion with us and sharing their path. That I think this is very useful for the students to know how people get to do what they do and why. So please, uh, Lorenzo, the yeah. floor is yours. Thank you very much. Again, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I'm Lorenzo Giambagli. I am a last year PhD student in uh, University of Florence in Italy and in University of um, uh, Namur in Belgium, because I'm doing the so-called joint PhD. Uh, my background is, uh, I mean, I would say that I'm a physicist in the sense that my bachelor degree has been in physics and uh, uh, astronomy. And my master degree, degree has been in uh, theoretical physicist, uh, physics with actually a focus on uh, uh, statistical mechanics and out of equilibrium physics. So my, my, my actually at the end of my, uh, my, uh, of my master, I had the opportunity to basically uh, enlarge a little bit my horizons. And uh, therefore I also uh, introduced lots of exams. I mean, lots not, but few examples from, from uh, University of Computer Science and uh, Engineer here in Florence because I was very fascinated by, I mean, basically when I started physics with the idea of doing complex systems physics, which is uh, mainly due to my passion to, I mean, studying brain and neuroscience. And after a while, I also become very interested in artificial intelligence and somehow everything leads to, my master thesis was basically on neuroscience, my, sorry, my bachelor thesis was on neuroscience and then my master thesis was on um, AI. So actually on, the, uh, an application of a graph theory uh, results to, to um, a deep neural network. And now my PhD is basically full on uh, artificial intelligence in the sense that I'm working a lot on with deep, deep neural networks and I study them with, uh, I mean, using the tools that I've been taught to. So using the, the, the tools of uh, somehow statistical physics of graph theory. And uh, that's basically my, my, my course and my, my and not, let's say my, yeah, my, my story. And uh, I would also say that, uh, yeah, I, I've been, I, I love artificial intelligence and actually the topic of studying deep neural network, mainly because I think that it's super hyper interdisciplinary. Like you can tackle the problem from every corner, like from every point of it. it it's fascinating, this thing. And because of the fact that I'm, I mean, also interested in biology and, and so on, mathematics is something that I love. And so I found that basically it was the perfect, uh, somehow the perfect topic. And uh, that's basically why uh, as a physicist, I end up studying neural, deep neural network, which unfortunately is something that is not that common as someone might think in the sense that there are lots of physicists who use neural network today, especially in high energy physics. And, uh, but um, there are not as many people who studies them. There are some of them that I know for it, with, with, uh, uh, which tackle the problem of interpretability, as we will, I will explain you everything, hopefully during the course, uh, using uh, um, statistical mechanics and lots of other techniques, but it uh, is not super common. Now it's a field that is of course exploding, as you might have guessed, thanks to the release of lots of, uh, let's say, um, easy to use tools like uh, the very famous nowadays chat GPT or Dolly or other different kind of artificial intelligence, which I have to, to, to say are doing a lot of um, marketing for us <laughs> in the sense that there are lots of students uh, asking us for a thesis uh, in, in our department because me and my group are more or less the only ones with, that are interested in theoretical aspects of learning. And so, I hope that today I will try, I will be able to convey some of the messages and some of the um, core ideas that are behind the, the uh, deep learning in the sense that I, 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 I basically 
constructed the course so that it is it, it should be very introductive and very um, uh, open to everyone. And I mean, as I was saying, feel free to ask me questions of any kind on my background or whatever you want during the lesson. And you can also write me if you want. My email is uh, Lorenzo. But so feel free to write me for any doubts or curiosities even after the lesson or really when you want and uh, actually the this first lesson will be uh on let's say somehow theoretical basics or genetical foundations of how to frame a machine learning problem so an, uh, an automatic learning problem then the following two will be more on neural networks more on deep neural networks and the last one will be a little bit more on my uh, research and so on how i use tools from graph theory and also sometimes dynamical systems to understand certain kind of neural networks of course, uh, as a physicist, I'm not an expert in probability or on very um, or, or on topics that are more, for example, applicative. So uh, this first lesson, of course, would be something uh, that you, I, I will try to convey concept that I'm I had to know and I had to understand somehow. But uh, maybe from a formal point of view, some of you, if you are very much into measure theory or stuff like that, will be a little bit disappointed. I think I don't know. We will see. We will see. So if uh, uh, let's, I think we can start like with the uh, uh, and by by saying some examples because I'm assuming that lots of you maybe uh, are in this course because you say okay I've heard about this thing that is called AI about this thing that is called machine learning what it is uh, how does it work so the the uh, the idea is that. Um, uh, AI is something that is uh, is is a super general and very broad topic. Every time that we want a machine or or something, I would say, inanimate to uh, uh, simulate to emulate the uh, human intelligence, we are doing something that is AI. Now, of course, we can try to um, tackle this problem. So to solve this problem of imitating human intelligence by developing machines that learns from experience, from some kind of experience. And when we do this, when we uh, write algorithms that learn so that uh, basically try to convey the idea of learning through experience, we are doing machine learning or automatic learning. So as one computer scientist called uh, Tom Mitchell said, uh, basically something that is uh, um, a computer program learns when it has uh, an experience. So we will find, let me, okay, let me erase this. So Tom Mitchell basically uh, focused on three fundamental aspects or, or in order to say that some, that a machine is learning. Experience, a task, and a performance measure. So a machine or a, a computer program, basically, is said to learn from an experience at a given task if, if its performance in measure increase, so gets better somehow with the experience. And there are lots of tasks in which this framework can be used and it's very useful. For example, let's assume that you want, uh, I don't know, something that takes your input your uh, um, uh, your email account and tells you whether an email is a spam so it's something that you don't want or let's think about something that is an algorithm that takes a text and tells you if the person who wrote the text is somehow positive or negative or let's assume that you have an image, a very, uh, I mean, of whatever kind of picture, let's say a, a set of images of cats and dogs. And this, uh, this algorithm is, is capable of uh, solving the problem of understanding if in the image is uh, represented a dog or a cat. One thing we, we, we can ask ourselves is, uh, sorry, I, I, I'm not seeing the chat. Should I, should I read this? Or, okay, no, okay. Yeah, please uh, use the microphone if you want to interrupt me because I, uh, I, I don't think I will 
always look at the chat. So the, the thing is, if you, what, what, all, what does or all of those um, uh, tasks have in common? They all have in common that we want something, an algorithm that takes data and gives you a function, a function that is capable of solving you the, the, a problem, of, uh, that is capable of doing well in a given task, okay? So this kind of structure here is the typical structure of a machine learning problem. So solving a machine learning problem, problem ultimately, ultimately means having a function that is capable of inferring something new about data that we haven't used, that we, uh, that we haven't used to train them. To, to train it that that's more or less like super generally what we will try to do and we will try to decompose this by analyzing the three ingredients that we have the experience the task and the performance measure so the task is for example i don't know what the, the ones that i told you are all example of tasks so like the noising is another kind of task for example if you if you if you have uh, if, if you want to remove noise from an image that's an example of a task the sentiment analysis which is the one that i told you of analyzing if the person who wrote the text is some is saying something positive or something negative is another example of a task classifying images is a classification so it's another kind of task and of course if you want to i don't know uh, predict which will be the value of a house in a given region in uh, three days or more then this is a regression which is another kind of task then there is the performance measure now the performance measure is something that is deeply uh, it's a concept that somehow uh, is the following we want to be able to quantify the error. This is something that is super crucial in machine learning, in, in, in building a, a machine learning algorithm. And then there is the experience. And the experience is how, um, how you process your data somehow, because any kind of algorithm ultimately uh, is ground, I mean, needs some data to work on the images, the text, uh, the, uh, the, the, the prices of the houses, and so on and so forth. And the way how you, you elaborate those data determines the uh, experience. There are basically three kinds of experience. The first bit that I call supervised learning. Yeah. No, okay. Supervised. Learning, same supervised learning or unsupervised learning. In this course, we will focus on one of them, which is the supervised learning, because it's the easier, it's the easiest one to convey to me. In the supervised learning scheme, you are at your disposal, both uh, your data, and you also know what your machine should give you for each thing in your data. This will be much more clear, of course, in the, uh, in the following lesson. And for example, the regression, so the linear regression, is a type of, 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 um, is a type of supervised learning uh, algor uh, algorithm that actually you have, I'm sure, already encountered. And uh, the semi-supervised is something a little bit different. It's something that is more connected to not understanding exactly what the machine should do, but only knowing something that is, I mean, only knowing uh, the concept of this is not good or this is good. A very classical example of a supervised learning problem, of a semi-supervised learning or reinforced learning problem, problem is, uh, learning a new game like chess okay if you if you play chess or if you play backgammon or whatever when you are learning it you only know at the end of the of the play very often that you have lost or that you have won okay so you only know those very par those partial information you don't know what kind of move you should have done in order to win okay so this is Another different, I mean, another kind class of, of, of learning we will not get into, but it's very, very, very nice and also very, uh, very important nowadays, I think. The, the another one is the unsupervised learning, which is a kind of, of, of um, it, which is a kind of, um, 
uh, of experience somehow that is basically um, only grounded on data. So you 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 don't know nothing, and this is this is something quite quite strange to convey maybe because uh, let's assume that you've got images and you want to classify them. So you want to say, okay, this is an image that contains a cat, this is an image that contains a dog, this is an image that contains whatever, but you don't have the label. So, so you don't have, but you will not have in an unsupervised learning task, someone who tells you this is a cat, this is a, a dog, okay? And this is something that is a problem that can be solved, of course, but you don't know how many labels are there, for example. And you want your algorithm to say, okay, I think that here there are three classes and those are, the group, the groups. Okay. Again, we will not del uh, delve in the deep into this uh, the, the thing. So, let's start now for real with the um, supervised learning scheme, and I will try to be a, a, as clear as possible during my my explanation. But again, feel free to interrupt. So, what we want to what, what we, do, do we want to build? Do you want to build something, of course, that takes as an input data and returns a function. Now, how does data came in the form of, okay, which is very deeply connected again to the experience that we are doing. And those data, we will assume that we come in this form here. We will assume that there is a probability distribution. So there is a space X, we will call instance space. And we will assume that we can have a probability distribution P of X, where X belongs to the capital X space. Then we will assume that there is, exists another space that we will call Y, that is called the output space. And on Y, we will have a probability distribution that we call G of Y given X. That is called, or sometimes is also called the supervisor. Okay, so we will sample x from g of x, and then we will sample y from g of y. So x will be sampled, xi will be sampled from p of x, and then y will be sampled from g of y given y. Okay. Together, we can construct the sort of the joint probability distribution. Let me call again with a little bit of use of notation, let's say P data. That is, of course, of X, Y equal U of X times Y of X. Okay? What is the data set? How are the data, uh, when, how will the data appear to us? The data will appear as a set of X, I, Y, I from with a sample from P data. With I that goes from one to P. Why P? Because usually uh, in, in, my, in my field, let's say, it, it's usually uh, called pattern, number of pattern that the, the, the algorithm is seeing. This is something that is not standard. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there is not like very much agreement on notation and so on and so forth. So, I mean, I will try, of course, to be uh, very um, standardized during the, the lessons, but then to me, the number of data that we have at our disposal is something like that. An example, uh, X is an image, Y is a label that is written, we would written cat or X, is a number and y is the dependent variable that we know is, uh, for, for example, a function f of x. Those are all examples of data that are coming in this way. Of course, I will be more precise as, uh, as soon as we will get, uh, we will um, advance toward the course, okay? Now, once, uh, once we have done that, we, will, we, would, like, um, we would like to, uh, to build, of course, so if this is clear, let me erase this. Now that we have our data, so somehow deeply connect to our experience because this is a supervised, uh, semi -super, uh, sorry, a supervised learning task.
let me define the um, per, uh, another other two very important concepts. And uh, in order to 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 find those two to to define those two important concepts, let me first tell you which is our goal. A little more. Okay. We would like to set up an algorithm that takes the data set D, takes the performance measure. Let me call this performance loss function. And also takes as an input another thing that I will call H, that is called the hypothesis space. And the hypothesis space is the space I would like to search my function in. Okay. The algorithm takes all of that and gives you a function f hat. Okay. This is what we want to achieve. Now we have defined the data set. D. Let me now define the function space. But again, a basic I've already defined. You uh, let, let me do a, let, let me give you examples of the function space, and then I will define. I mean, I will tell you how to construct a proper loss function. Then we will uh, put everything together. But I think we will put everything together in the in the in the next lesson. So now we have to define our data set D. We let me define also H that is called hypothesis space. And usually the hypothesis space is something that is a function family parametrized. So the hypothesis space can can be can appear somehow, can 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 be seen as something that is a map from let's say R n to the space of function on a certain or of a certain kind. An example, uh, linear functions map a set of parameters, let me call theta those parameters. They are mapped to theta scalar, uh, the scalar product x. I don't know how you are, are you used to do the scalar product. This is something that is sometimes is also written in this way. Those are examples of hypothesis space. Polynomials can be another example of hypothesis space. Okay, so my hypothesis space is the space where my algorithm, which I have already, uh, I haven't told you how it would work, but my algorithm will look for my function that solves my problem. So what does it mean solves my problem? It means that it takes all the data and after this algorithm has run, it returns me a function that on other data is capable of telling me for example, their class is capable of telling me their um, their value if it is a regression and so on and so forth. So, this is the hypothesis space where I will look my well my algorithm will look my function in. At last, let me define the loss function and let me tell you how to construct the loss function. This might look, I think, I mean, I I, I don't know, but maybe it will look, it looks somehow abstract. But I hope that after we add all those ingredients. We will let them collapse, and you will say, oh, "Okay, no, it's not that difficult because I, I, you have already seen something very, 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 very close to it." But so we we'll give me feedback, of course. If you say, "Oh, I'm not, I'm not getting nothing," okay, we, we can, of course, we can arrange uh, how we, we, we keep, uh, how we continue. So um, the loss function L. Works as follows: is a function that goes from y times y to r. Okay, we can also say maybe r plus, but still, okay. Let's say r plus for the moment. So this is what uh, what the loss function is, basically. The loss function takes two labels. In, 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 in practice, it will be the, 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 the real label of my data and the predicted label of my data. And it will return me a measure of how, this, um, of how am I doing well. 
Okay, and it's a, a crucial ingredient because, as I told you, it's fundamental to quantify what does um, what does error mean, what does mistaking mean. Okay, so how can I construct a loss function? And I think that when I tell you how to construct them, you will be oh, okay. It's something that, that makes sense. Okay, let's assume that my hypothesis space H is like. A, something that is a probability so it's like a probability so i'm very general now and for example this is like a p model i will call it in the gray so it's a probability function of x parameterized by a set of parameters theta okay so this is my hypothesis space Okay, so my hypothesis space is something that actually is a probability function. How can I construct a loss function? Okay, in theory, what do I want? Of course, my problem, my learning problem, so is completely, is completely solved. This is something that I, I'm sure we can all agree on. I'm capable from my data to obtain the proper P data. So the P of X, Y. This would be my goal, right? Or oh, maybe it's goal. If I have this, I, I've solved everything. So I, I've completely solved my problem because I know the real probability distribution of my data. And this is, this is what I would like to achieve. Unfortunately, of course, the, the magic word of uh, mathematics and probability, unfortunately, it's never, I mean, we can never access this, okay? We can never access the real data distribution. In order to give you an example, let's go back to our classical um, classification of images of uh, cats and dogs. It's very difficult to, to, to understand which is the probability function that given an image assigns a label uh, a dog or a label cat with a certain uh, value. Okay, this is a, a very strange probability function. And also more even stranger is the probability function P of X, which is the distribution of all the possible images of cats and dogs. It's very weird, right? It's, it's a, those are very strange probability distribution we, we are very, that, that are very difficult to parameterize. And for example, uh, uh, let, let's also think as um, with, with, the, with the text problem. So if you want to classify whether a text is positive or negative, my goal will be that given a text, it would tell the, the algorithm will tell me, okay, this text is positive, and I'm pretty confident about that with probability 0 0.99, or this text is negative, and I, I'm pretty confident on that, or I'm not pretty confident. This is what I would like to have, right? So a function that solves this for every kind of text and for every kind of images or whatever. But this is very difficult to, 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 to obtain, and the real structure of those problems are somehow in, almost impossible to, 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 to understand in, in real world uh, applications. Uh, so what we can do is approximate the proper P of X, Y in the best case, but actually we don't care about really P of X, Y. Generally, we only care about the P the, so what I call the G of Y given X, the supervisor. We would like to approximate to, to approximate this, right? This is what we would like because usually we have images already and we want to classify them. So we want to understand given an image if the label of a cat, which is the probability that this image is a cat. Okay, so um, very often the model is not like a model of X. It's a model of Y given X, okay? So this is how I will, generally speaking, look for the, the, the solution of my problem, my FH somehow, okay? And one very easy way to, to, uh, to build a loss function is simply by uh, writing in, ma in mathematical formulas what I'm telling you. So I would like that if I have a data set, D, which I've already defined like that, What I would like is a probability that, let's say, we, we, this is something we can assume, that maximize the, the, um, the probability that my model has generated exactly those data. 
This is the so-called maximum likelihood principle. And it's a, a very natural principle because I, I want to look for the proper set of parameters here because I parameterize my P model with a set of parameters, which is the so-called um, hypothesis space of the problem. And what I want now is find the proper set of parameters. How can I look for a very nice set of parameters? I want that will solve my problem, or at least that uh, is very close to the proper solution of my problem. One way is to find the theta that is equal, the theta hat, that is equal to the argmax over theta of the probability of my data, somehow, of having observed my data, with respect to t. So basically, this thing is exactly the R max over theta of P of x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on and so forth. Okay. I want to maximize this because why? Because I have observed them. So it means that their probability, so the probability of having observed them is very high. This is how I tackle the problem for the moment, okay? And how can I do this? Well, actually, there is a very simple way which I can, I, I can somehow solve this problem. If I assume that or all my X and Y, so all my data elements, are all IID variables. I'm sure you know what IID, IID means. It means that they are um, identical variables in terms of distribution. So they are all distributed in the same way and they are all independent. This assumption is assumption is an assumption that is absolutely not true, <laughs> usually. Okay. I mean, as somehow an approximation of the problem that we can use in order to develop a proper loss function that actually works pretty well. And so we can we will assume that i that x i y i are all i i b. And what can we do now? We can do a very a very nice thing. Because the probability of the joint distribution, so having observed all the data, is nothing but the product of all this probability of having observed of having observed each one of them. So this will be the R theta will be exactly equal to the R max over theta of P model of Y uh, yeah, Y I given X I. With the product over all i's from one to p. Now, how can I solve the? Okay, this is actually is this quantity here. If I maximize this quantity here, this would be. I mean, this would be a very a very nice way in which I can tackle the problem of finding the real g of y given x. Okay, this could be a way, but this uh, actually this product is quite bad from a numerical point of view because those are all probability, those are all very small numbers. So it, it can be actually pretty pretty easy if you have a very large number of data for this value here to be small, to be very small. And so it's better if we if we handle this in this way. We can use uh, we can actually apply the logarithm to this, the natural logarithm. And uh, sorry. A question. Yeah, there is a question. Yeah, of course, it is. It is. It is absolutely possible. It is absolutely possible. You can rephrase everything with the bias. Uh, uh, yeah, with, with I mean, with a Bayesian approach, and you can actually modify this slightly using the maximum likelihood principle. This is yeah. You can do, definitely do this. After the course, I will give you, after this lesson, I will give you a, a, a set of books where you can, of course, go much more deep into what I'm saying you and a set of articles, hopefully, where you can delve much more deeply into that. So the, the answer is yes, you definitely can. And actually, if you do this, I mean, doing this, I don't know if I have time because unfortunately, <laughs> It's, the topic is super huge, but you can also do some, uh, we, we can also use some kind of links we can also use the, we can also sorry link this way of tackling of tackling the problem 
by saying that uh, uh, with the fact that we our um, our problem is regularized so it, it, that we want to look for some kind of um, simple solution inside of the possible space of, of probability function or, 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 or functions but this is something that i don't know if i have time to do but yeah it's a very interesting and it's a very proper question so if we uh, apply the logarithm here the logarithm is a monotonous increasing monotonous function so this is pretty easy to, to, to show that it's exactly equal to the R max over theta of the sum now over I from one to B of the logarithm of P model by I given X I parameterized by this. And it actually, it's very easy also to, I mean, I'm sure you'll agree that nothing changed if I do something like that. If I multiply and divide by, by P. And this is exactly, I mean, do, if you look carefully and we ignore this P here, so that's, which is actually, it's a number, so it doesn't change the property of the, of, 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 of the problem minimum or the problem maximum, sorry. Uh, if I divide, so it, it, it is one over P, times that, I'm sure you have already guessed it, is exactly the approximation of uh, the, the, the estimator of the um, expected value of this uh, observable here. So this is basically the expected value, or at least converged to expected value over where weighted thanks to a probability distribution P, which is hopefully the p of the data of this log of p model y i given by i parameterized by p. This is the principle that is also called the maximum likelihood principle. And, uh, um, and uh, it's a way in which we can construct loss functions. Why? Because as soon as we assume a functional form of our p model, we will see that a function, a loss function, so a proper way of quantifying how much am I staking on average on the real distribution of the data is given. So let's now do an example, which will, I'm sure, will pick in your mind. Let's assume that my data, so y, are not, are not discrete, but are continuous. So let's assume that my y's are equal to r, OK? And then again, let's assume that my instance space x is also equal to some kind of interval inside r, OK? So very, very, very easy, very easy setting for us, actually. What we, we can, uh, um, what we can assume is that our P model of Y given X parameterized by theta. Theta is a, a vector for me. I'm sorry, I will, so theta, I, I, I will, I don't know if you are familiar with the notation with the line above, with the notation with nothing above. So let, let's assume that uh, theta is a parameter. Theta uh, is a vector. Okay. Let's assume that I've, my P model is as follows. One over square root of two pi sigma E to the minus Y minus F of X theta square over two sigma square. Let's assume this, okay? Now, what are we saying? We are saying that given an X, my Y is sampled from a probability distribution that is a Gaussian centered on F of X theta, which is a function that I'm not, I'm not specif specifying now. For example, we can say, if we want to specify that F is as theta times X. Or we can say that it's like x squared 
plus so theta one x squared plus theta two x plus theta three. This is another kind of x which we have we could have specified. If we do this, we can ask ourselves how will our maximum likelihood principle behave under this assumption? And if we do that, I'm sure you will trust me that what we will obtain is applying the logarithm, the sum over i of the logarithm to this function here. Okay, so of course, this is, I wanna, this is a, a product between this and that. So I wanted to find the argmax of that, and this leads to the argmax of the logarithm of the sum over i to be to logarithm of one over uh, square root of two pi sigma minus the y i minus f of x y i theta square over two sigma square. This is a number, so it will not affect my arg max sign, but my max my mm, uh, the, will not affect my procedure of finding the maximum, so I can ignore it. And so this minus can change the arg max into an arg min. And voila, what you have is the arg my your best theta will be the arg min over theta of this quantity here. So the sum over i p of y i minus f of x i theta squared over two sigma squared, which is very close, I'm sure, to what you have already uh, heard, maybe, as the mean square error. Why is it close? Because again, if I multiply and divide by one over p this quantity and ignore the first p, so if I multiply by one over p, this is the mean square error. If this quantity is the same for everybody, I mean, or it's a, a, a special case, so I'm assuming that the variants are the same for every i, but it's something that I can also relax and I can also introduce a lot of different uh, uh, things. But then again, this having choose having chosen this kind of probability distribution of the model, I've obtained using the maximum likelihood principle a performance measure, which is the loss function. So on average, how am I deviating uh, weighted with the square from the proper uh, fr from the proper label of the data? So this is my prediction. F, of course, of the x theta will be my prediction because why? Because I'm working, I mean, as I said, my P model is my hypothesis space. So how am I parametrizing this Gaussian is my choice. If I choose F to be, uh, uh, to be uh, uh, um, uh, a plane, so F to be uh, a linear function, this will lead to a certain kind of results, okay? Otherwise, it will be to other it will be to other kind of results. When I find the, the theta parameter in, in, in this problem here, I'm done because theta hat is my estimation of the proper function, of the proper p of the model, of the of the of the real p of the supervisor of g, the what I what I call the g of y given x. I want now to 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 think about uh, to, let, let's look more carefully on the on this. Okay, so I would like to find the minimum. Of the, with respect to theta of this expression here. And this expression here is given once you have your data set. Okay? Well, it's given, of course, once you have your data set and once you have defined your hypothesis space. So now I have hypothesis space, data, I have my loss function, and the algorithm basically consists in minimizing over theta this quantity here. If this quantity, is convex on theta, or if this quantity is not convex with respect to theta, of course, this has a dramatic behavior on the result of my algorithm, on the problem. Why am I saying that? Because the maximum likelihood principle 
um, is something that can be also mean much more um, carefully uh, said and with all the, uh, the the different shenanigans can be uh, the, well written and uh, basically to sum up very very uh, very much what happens is that it guarantees you that if you have a lot of data you will converge to the proper g of y given of y given x to the proper one which is your goal remember so if you have a lot of data and you, you, you will be you converging to that if you are parameterizing well your function so if your your hypothesis space is large enough and if there is only a single correspondence between your theta and the so between if in your space there is only one function that actually can solve this problem yeah there is, there is a question yeah oh yeah sorry. Corrado. so Please. the loss Corrado? yeah yeah exactly so the loss is validating how our model is predicting i'm, I'm reading in the chat yeah, the loss function, as I told you, is basically a way of saying, how am I mistaking? And of course, there are several ways in which you can write this, this concept here. I could have started by saying, one way is the mean square error. That's it, which is naively right, right? You, I'm saying that the more your F, so your high, your like the way you have parameterizing uh, your probability of the model in your hypothesis space somehow is closer to the proper y the more this number is small so if you find the proper y and you have if you have lots of data and you found a, a, a y uh, sorry a theta that actually is the minimum of this quantity so you are minimizing the loss function then this is a way in which you can tackle the uh, the problem so the learning problem so as soon as you have, this is the loss function. This is L, okay, is the loss function. Minimizing the loss function is my algorithm somehow, okay? Yeah, I had another comment there, which I think historically is what happened. So uh, Sorry, you I derive the loss function, yeah. from the hypothesis right so you derive the mean square error from the gaussian hypothesis space i think yeah that what yeah. gauss did was actually kind of reverse engineering he already have derived at the age of i think 20 or 30 he already have derived the through linear algebra right the least squares mm -hmm. and then uh, he had this idea of what's the probabilistic model that uh, is compatible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think you are you are you are, you are perfectly right. You're, you're perfectly right. And and as I said, there are several ways in which you can introduce in which you can uh, introduce the loss function. And yeah, you can also do the reverse engineering. Actually, I admit that I think that I've been uh, um, also in my uh, courses. I had followed the path that you are saying. So people have said, okay, this is what we want to do. So the mean square error is how we quantify the error. What is the underlying model now? And and we found the and I found we found the, that there is this uh, Gaussian hypothesis behind. So yeah, exactly, exactly. Interesting. So I, I I also said uh, I also um, okay, Daniele. I think also wrote something. It's quite interesting that, uh, how you derive the loss. Uh, the loss. Yeah, function. that's exactly. Uh, yeah, what I did. Ah, okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, perfect. Okay. Sorry, I also uh, have a question. So, yeah, this is uh, the... the oh, Lorenzo. Oh, all right, yeah. I also have a question. I yeah. mean, in, in the computation that you did, uh, essentially, your loss function is somehow equivalent to, uh, to the assumption that you did on the Gaussian structure of your uh, probability measure at the beginning. Is this the standard fact or, uh, I mean, it is an example and the usually one does a different thing. I mean, oh. uh, what seems really difficult is to guess the correct structure of the probability function at the beginning. Exactly. That's, that's absolutely true. Indeed, uh, this is a special case, uh, which to me is very... Um, uh, eloquent, is very uh, easy to understand because you have everything under control. Of course, when you are uh, dealing with a real machine learning problem, you can still apply the mean square error loss, 
but you are also losing a little bit of control on how your function behaves. And that, so for example, usually what you can do is simply map your hypothesis space, which can be, I mean, F, it can be whatever function here, right? You, you can always, uh, this is something I will do uh, in a moment, I think, you can always map a function into a probability distribution. And you would say, using, for example, the sigmoid function this is what we will do. And then you can say, okay, this is my P of the model. That's it. Okay. So, of course, this is an example. You're not always, got, and this example is also by, uh, quite didactic, of course. But yeah, uh, in, in real world application, you, will re you, you, you definitely relax a lot uh, this. Of course, if you are using a regression, if you are doing a regression, then actually, under the you, very often you will assume this. For example, you I mean in, in physics, for example, you you very often use the the Gaussian hypothesis. Maybe what happens is that the Gaussian is a little bit more complex, so it, it, it's something that is not exactly the same everywhere. You can also introduce more more and more um, uh, degrees of freedom. So yeah, this this is a very simplified problem. Definitely. Thank you. Oh no, no problem. So now let me do another example. And with the other, with this other example, we will have basically <laughs> tackled all the possible and the two most famous loss functions in machine learning. So I'm sure that after that you will be able to understand basically every kind of tutorial you can find online, which is one of the goal of this first lesson somehow of the of this course. Another thing that we, let's assume that y is equal to zero or one. So there are two classes to me. And again, X belongs to uh, X, which is uh, uh, a vector space. So let, 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 let's say that X equals Rn, okay? Now, one thing, one, one assumption that we will do on our P model, is that, and this is maybe we'll answer uh, a little more specifically your question, is that our labels are the result, so y and one, uh, zero and one, are the result of a sampling from this distribution here. So basically, let me write this also in this way, in more compact form. And I'm sure you have already seen this. What I'm saying is that my labels are sampled, so are the result of having sampled from this distribution here. So alpha is the probability that my label is one, and one minus alpha is the probability that my label is zero. This is a very simple assumption, okay? If alpha is equal to one half, so if this is such that it's equal to one half over every x, it means that my model is saying that my labels are given at random, totally at random. Now, if we plug this into the uh, same uh, procedure as before, what we, we, we obtain is something that I, I, I will... Uh, I mean, I, I will not derive it. It's very easy. It's also very, very interesting exercise. It's basically y i f of x i theta minus the logarithm. Uh, let, let, me, let me check is correct. Okay. The logarithm of 1 plus e to the f of x i theta summed all. And this will be the other loss function that we find, and it's called the cross entropy loss. Okay, so if we assume this probability distribution here for the labels, we will get this loss here, which is called the cross entropy loss. Now, what? Let, 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 let's now stop for a second and understand uh, carefully what we, what are we writing on the blackboard. So what we are saying here is that this is the way to control the probability of the class to be at zero or a one. 
So, uh, let, let, let understand very, very well what's happening. Sigma is the sigmoid function. If you, I, I'm sure you have already um, encountered a sigmoid function. If you haven't, sigma of z is equal to one over one plus e to the minus z. So it's a function that is like this. If this is r, it map goes from zero, basically in minus infinity, to one half, and then it's at most one. So this maps z, if z is a function, to something that is a number between zero and one. So this is a way, a very common way in which in machine learning, we map every an arbitrary function to a probability distribution. What are we saying? Let's assume that if um, f of x, so let me erase this. This is something you will find both in the notes and also in, uh, in the books I will tell you. What are we saying? We are saying that in our x space, so in our capital X space, this surface, Let's assume that the theta are fixed. So are the one that we have at the end of the learning, once we have minimized the loss, this loss function, f of x theta equals zero. Okay, this is a, 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 a manifold in our space, in our x, which has this property. When f of x equals zero, sigma of zero is always one half. So it's the decision boundary of the problem f of x before was the mean of the of each Gaussian in the space which we were sampling our y, so our regression, our de dependent variable, variable from. Now f of x is the decision boundary in our space. So if this is our space and f of x is some, or equal zero is something like that, it means that the further we go from f of x, then the higher the probability that this is a one, for example, and if we go on the other way, the higher the probability that this is a zero. Very easily, if this is a plane, we can basically say that if f of x is a plane, we are saying that in our x space, in our instant space, we have the more we are away. So uh, with the, more, the more we are away from the play, the um, from w, uh, sorry from theta x equals zero, this is what theta hat at x equals zero. The farther the farther we are, the more we belong to a class according to our model. So this is the decision boundary. The what is called also the decision boundary of the problem. Clearly. The decision boundary of the problem is a very important choice. If we are saying that our f of x is a line, it has a very non-trivial impact on all the possible uh, class we can you can differentiate. Because if f of x is a y is a line, then we are assuming that our space in this is divided into two regions, the ones and the zeros. However, if those two regions cannot be separated by a line, there is no way in which we can solve this problem, okay? Or at least our solution would be, would be a very bad solution. So it's very important to understand properly which kind of F we should assign to, to, to that classification problem. And basically, now I will turn up, uh, I will come back, uh, back again to the, the, what I, was, uh, I wanted to, to tell you before. If the, in, we, when I do the, Eventually, what we are doing, as I was saying, is that we have this path. This is the path I'm, I'm telling you. And this is something I hope will be also useful when we I would like to when I will try to convey you how neural network works somehow. And this is the thing we have uh, um, we define our P model. Which means that we define H, our hypothesis space, then we construct L, then we evaluate L on our data and on our P model of data somehow, which is parameterized, and then we minimize of theta 
of this loss function. This is the flow we, we, we will encounter a lot later, okay, in, in, the, in the following, in the next lesson. If the problem is not, the, the, the problem is, if the problem is not convex with respect to theta, this is something which is a problem for us because we, we, we don't have a proper global minimizer. And actually, this is something that, I mean, in principle, is something bad for us, right? Because we, can, we don't have a, a unique theta. So which, we, which one is the proper one? We lose our guarantees that our loss function in the, in the limit of, of, a, of a very large amount of data will find the proper P data. This is something we will lose. What we will discover is that the, what, what happened in neural network is something that basically is completely away from this picture here because the problem is highly non-convex with respect to theta. But nevertheless, this will mean that there are a lot of solutions in our space of theta, which will be in correspondence with proper P model. And those P model are basically equivalent. This is a, a typical behavior of neural network, which can, which is something that is also believed to be at the core of their efficacy, of their way of working. Okay. So despite here being a problem, this is something we don't want, we will relax it and say, okay, let's say that it's not convex anymore. So finding this admin will be something pretty difficult. It's not trivial. It, it's not just computing the gradient and doing gradient descent because the loss function of, with respect to theta is not something like that, that you can simply goes down in, but it's something more complex. Okay. And if this is what happens indeed, actually, we have to find a way of minimizing this with respect to theta in this scenario. Okay, so doing this is precisely what uh, training neural network will be for us. So I will be more, more specific on that later. Now let me conclude with another last uh, step, which is very important, which is that now that we have ended our learning problem, now that we have ended, sorry, now that we have defined the, our, my, our learning algorithm, A, how it works, it finds these mini moments, as I told you, and so on and so forth. We have a function, a f hat. Now, which are the performance of f hat? Is f hat a good function or is it a bad function? Because as I told you, what happens is on the that we, are, we have some kind of guarantees of, 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 of we, we are sure that our uh, algorithm will be, um, will be working properly if we are in the limit of very large data. But unfortunately, that's something that doesn't happen. We will have a fixed amount of data. So the question we are trying to ask now is after the, 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 the optimization process, so after the end of when I have, after having written everything and after having solved the argmin the arg uh, with respect to theta of the, loss, of, of the loss function, how can I evaluate if my f hat is the proper one? That's the question I, I, we want to ask. And as I will try to, 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 to tell you, this is a very, very hard question, but there are behaviors that are kind of recurrent in the field. And so this is how we can try to understand this problem. So evaluate F at, we have a data set D, we have a realization D, let, let me call this the I, because maybe we can have several realization of that. Okay, we can have several uh, data sets, maybe. So now we will work in this assumption. This assumption is that G of Y given X is equal to the delta, with the Dirac delta of Y minus May I ask a question? May I ask a question? Yeah. If yeah. you have a several data set why do you consider them separately and not uh, unite them uh, in a unique data set you're, you're perfectly right this is uh, because now what i'm trying to understand is conceptually how can i tackle the problem of uh, evaluating a function so this is uh, it's not now the, the learning process is finished now okay. okay so now we have another problem is my f hat the uh, the right one okay. and in order to 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 tackle this problem i have to to do two kind of steps because the first one is assume that i can sample as much as i want from the from my my data distribution which i know is tricky but it's an assumption that i i try to 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 do in order to understand how am I going with this problem so with the problem of finding the i have had of then at the end i will tell you what really happens Okay, so the, the thing is, if 
without, uh, if I'm not uh, capable of finding anything with all those very nice assumptions, then no way I will find the, the proper solution in real world problem. So now let me assume that this is the structure of G. So basically my Y are deterministic sample from uh, uh, according to the function E. And let me write down this quantity here and then we can comment it. Called, uh, okay. Let, let call, let's call this quantity M as E of D. This quantity here, what, what, what is this quantity here saying? He's saying, let's assume that you do several times your learning algorithm on several data sets, okay? How is your learning algorithm result dif differing from the proper function T with the square, okay? So this, if this number is zero, it means basically that if I compute a lot of time, the, 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 um, if I run several times my learning algorithm for different data set, then I will always get the proper T, which is something that never happens somehow. But this is a theoretical thing for now, for the moment, okay? But it, it really helps me to introduce two very important concepts, if I have time, I hope that I will. Now, this is something that I can write as F hat B square plus t square minus two f scalar let, 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 let's assume that we have a sum of scalar product t like that okay so this is what what's written here the average of that would be the let, let, let's start with these three terms here so two is easy the expected value over the distribution of the, of the data set of t square is t square because it's a number, it's fixed, it doesn't depend on d. So h of d somehow is the probability distribution that I sample from in order to obtain my data, which basically is the joint probability distribution of having a, 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 all, the, all the string of x, y, x, y, x, y, and so on and so forth. But still, this is t square. Unfortunately, let them see. I'll try to go to be uh, more, more, more precisely on that at uh, the end, but still. This is T square. Then, this, the, the, the term three here, well, this, this is quite easy. This is minus two T scalar with the expected value over the distribution over the data set B of my F hat B. Okay? What's that? So the expected value over H of D of this quantity here, which is basically on the, on with, with several different data set, how much is my, uh, which is the expected value of my half square of D? So the result of my optimization process, the result of my optimization process actually can be written. So this can be easily uh, solved recalling that the variance of F half of D is equal to the expected value of half half of the square minus the expected value of half half of the whole square. So this, the expected value of this square is exactly the variance minus this one. And so we have, we can in one line somehow write down one of the most important concepts in learning which is the following. The M S E over D of my function F hat of D is equal to the variance over D, let me call this in this way, of F hat of D plus the E of F hat of D square plus t square minus two t, the expected value over the distribution of the data of t of f hat of t, which is exactly something that I can write in this way. The variance over d of f hat d 
plus the bias square, so plus E minus E B F hat B square. So this, which is how much on average, where, where the average is taken with, with respect to how I sample my data set. So if I run several times my uh, learning algorithm, so my optimization algorithm, after having find the loss uh, hypothesis space and so on and so forth, I fix the data set and I obtain one half. Okay. Then I again goes on this. I do the same the same operation for another data set and so on and so forth. This is what I get. Now let me define this quantity here as f bar. What, what is f bar? f bar is the average of all my f. So if I extract this, this is precisely how much my target function is deviating from my mean function inside my space, in, in, or, or the, which is the result of my data set. Okay, so for each data set, I do, the I, I do my learning algorithm, I obtain an f. I do this several times, then I do the average of all these f. I assume that this is something feasible. And if this is something feasible, feasible how much my square difference is, is, is inside my data set is something that I can write as the variance over d of f hat b plus the bias square of f. Usually it, it's written in this way. So inside my data set, this is what my MSE will look like. But this is something that, again, it's just a subset of the whole possible, um, or, or, I mean, if I do this for 100 data set, still it's nothing compared to the sample of all my that distribution of the data. So this is a, is a, is a quite delicate concept. We, we, we may, maybe we will come on this again later. So in the, in the next lesson, but the idea is that what I can do is, I mean, this is for a given data set. If I want to really find how well my algorithm works in finding the proper F hat, I can do this by doing the average over the real distribution of data which is something that I don't know. Here, everything is theoretical here, but it's the behavior of, of that that will tell us a lot of things of this MSP of P. This is a very important thing we call MSP, mean square error. So there, are, there is now, I, I have to finish unfortunately, but there are two contributions to the, how on average my, I will deviate from the proper function t, which is the target function, which I have supposed exists and it's unique, okay? I will deviate from this on square thanks to a term, which is the variance of my learning algorithm depending on the data. So how much my day is this fluctuating somehow? Plus, and this is something that of course I have to properly evaluate, uh, average on my distribution of data. So this is a, an abstract step, but we will come on back, back on this later if you want. So this is the first step. And then how far am I, my mean function? So my, my average of all the results of every fitting process deviates from the proper one. So how far my F bar deviates from the target. Those two terms here, average over the distribution of the data. So this is a theoretical step, but it's fundamental. So we are saying, okay, I know this is uh, something theoretical, but, I, but, but I, I, we will, I will tell you how to approximate this empirically then. Actually, those two quantities here are what basically bounds how well my algorithm is working, okay? So this is uh, uh, the thing, and as we will see, hopefully, I think now, the next time, is that the behavior? Let, let me do this in very, very, very fast so that you can then find the proper links in books and so on and so forth. If I plot the complexity of my hypothesis space, this MSE is something that, I mean, again, more uh, um, hand wavingly goes like that. 
So for a low complex, for low complexity, I will have a large MSE, but also for high complexity, I will have a large MSE. Here, what happened is that here, the in, in this case here, the bias is very large, the bias squared. And in this case here, the variance is very large. And what, what we will see is that actually this concept is fundamental and it's very relevant with neural network, but we'll come on that more uh, than, than the next, uh, the next uh, time by explaining very well what, what, what's written here. And then we are basically the next lesson, I will say, which is our hypothesis space? Our hypothesis space are the probability distribution parameterized by a neural network. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Let's thank Lorenzo, please. Thank you, thank you. And uh, <clears throat> I think that, uh, well, you said there are no time for extra questions. <laughs> you have well, to- no, no, nobody has, has told me to leave, so you, you, you can, you can. Okay, okay, so are there other questions for, uh, for Lorenzo? Mr. Lorenzo, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can. Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for the lecture. No, and the second, I mean, the, there's a basic question regarding the your, your hypothesis, your initial hypothesis. Because, I mean, you start saying that, um, I don't remember, like, the phrasing you used, but, like, the, I don't know if the, the Ys, the Y variables, they are uh, I, I, D or something. If yeah. the ones. And yes. uh, I was told that it, it isn't really that much uh, realistic assumption, end of yeah. the day. But, like, uh, it does job, so, okay. So my, my question is, uh, like, in which situations it doesn't do the job or uh, and if there is any other reasonable assumption that you could make the uh, on the distribution of the these Y's that um, would be more reasonable, more, I don't know, physically reasonable and still would uh, enable you to do the calculations? Well, um, I would say that if you assume to know the correlation and estimate mm -hmm. the correlation, then of, you can still introduce them in your uh, in your uh, uh, loss function and be able to uh, yeah. to write down it. For, uh, I, I think that uh, I can give you examples on uh, on that side for the um, uh, for a regression case in theoretical physics. Sure. Uh, and, and I think now people are, are saying that they have to to, to leave, but still mm -hmm. there are there are ways in which you can by assuming the correlation do something. This is of okay. course is true. Very often you say okay. The problem, I mean, you in the end you will evaluate how your just how your function is, and if your function works properly on you know, on a statistical sense, you are safe that somehow if your uh, your net your your optimization for your learning algorithm has still worked very uh, um, was working very well despite your hypothesis was wrong, which unfortunately mm -hmm. is something you have to do. You have to do it. Because yeah. otherwise uh, with the calculation it's very tough. But you mm -hmm. can relax it and assuming their for their functional form and do the calculation that's that that definitely is a, is a case mm -hmm. an example is for ex I, I think you can do there is a there are algorithms that does this in the reinforced learning scheme so in the in the uh semi-supervised learning scheme mm -hmm. All right. but I'll, I'll tell you more of the next lesson if you want mm -hmm. that's fine thank you thank you very much well, more questions no so uh, okay, let me uh, let, let me do this. If you give me one second, I will detach myself from the um, from the uh, system here, and then I will uh, uh, go using use my 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 webcam so that we we, we have more time to speak. Okay, yes. give me give me one second. A question for Stefanella: Do you post the, the recording of this lecture somewhere? Yes. yes. We have the web page of our school. One second. We have a uh, school web page. Okay, you didn't it was, uh, there is the link uh, in the yes. mail you sent around. Uh, yes, so we okay. post all the videos there. And if there is extra material, we try to post it there as well. So as a sort of library, so people can go back uh, and see. Thank you. Well, it's very good also, for example, but what's important is the lecture of uh, the mini course on uh, uh, complex network by Cynthia. So there are a lot of, uh, most are in English, but some are in Portuguese. <laughs>
By the way, Dario, when you give a course, <laughs> you should come and give a course as well. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, not on AI. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> with pleasure, yes. Uh, well, uh, uh, you mean uh, uh, an online course? Uh, yes, or, uh, yes, uh, yes. This scheme uh, four hours. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Because we can arrange it. Uh, we can arrange it. Uh, we'll be very. Okay. We keep in touch. Thank because you. Because we have a course that are more applied. Some are more theoretical. For example, we had a course on um, uh, ergodic theory. It was excellent by Jacqueline Siqueira. So we have the, the whole spectrum. So try to combine people with different interests. So of course, your course will be very welcome. <laughs> nice. So bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dario. <clears throat> Thank you. Bye-bye.